Appleven stock or APP stock has fallen significantly since it's IPO'd just a few days ago, which made me wonder, is this a potential bargain, especially as the CEO compares the company's app building software and catalog of games to Netflix. So this, this got me interested. I want to see, is this potentially a bargain because the stock is down from its IPO price and pr down pretty significantly over the last few days. And the reality is there is a catalog of content here in terms of games and it makes sense for them to focus on either a catalog of app games or creating solutions for game providers as mobile games are about 39 percent of app downloads but the vast majority of consumers spend on apps over 70 percent but this is the reality is looking at app lovin or app stock it's more than just a catalog of games you know that makes money from these games there's actually this sort of business services, everything you need to grow your mobile apps, you know, creating solutions for other apps, other game apps. And you can see here's one of their key software solutions, which is app discovery, where we've driven 6 billion plus downloads and counting, i.e. you have an app, how do you make sure it's ending up with the consumers that you want it to? We help with app discovery, we help connect people on 6 billion downloads for these different apps. So this has been, you, you would think that is a really helpful tool for apps to get discovered. And then another key aspect is Max, another key software that they acquired, I think in 2018, which is a better way to monetize your mobile app, i.e., you know, so you've, you, you're able to acquire users, but now how do you make sure you're actually monetizing it, making money, i.e., let's, let's make sure there's revenue coming in from, let's say, the ad inventory. And so this is the correct tool, so that way you have correct bid asked, uh, you know, in terms of the supply of advertising that you can put in game and make money. And these are critical tools for growing a business. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about how much does it cost to acquire new users? What's the lifetime value of that user? And that's, that's really the formula for these business it's lifetime value versus the customer acquisition and you know sizing these up and these are you know between acquiring customers and monetizing them these these are covering the key elements these are the critical tools for modern app games and so here's one of the case studies with Knox Joy about how they started using these two software solutions by app Lovin, and they're saying Knox Joy generates 90 percent average revenue per daily active user lift and rockets pin rescue so that's their game to the top of the chart so because they were using this app discovery system not only did they have this 90 percent uptick in revenue but they're also dramatically able to increase their number of installs and presence so that they became one of the number one downloaded uh you know games internationally us uk russia and france and there are actually a lot of case studies that app 11 does talk about here so this does get me kind of excited to see this you know they talk about quadrupled installs in pin rescue and expanded their business so this is just one of several case studies and you know as i start thinking about it look there are a huge amount of game apps i mean there's there's nearly three million game apps out there in the in the apple app store or google you know app systems and only 0.1 percent make over a million dollars so there's a big opportunity for business solutions to help you know the other 99.9 .9 percent of providers out there to hey how do we figure out ways to monetize this and really grow our apps and really make this a sustainable business i mean this this just strikes me as a really ripe area for for potential and you know when when you think about tools for helping small businesses you know it, it, it made me think of shopify which you know really started off as you know hey we you know you you have a ceo trying to sell his own snowboards and then he goes you know what we should take the tools that we're building for ourselves and sell them to all these other players this is a very sort of similar business model that i would think about that you have with games where it's like oh okay here's how we monetize our games let's take these same tools and see if other businesses can benefit other apps can benefit and that's what they're leaning into and so when i see this sort of business to business solution in what is arguably a very big market and then i look at shopify and shopify is one of the greatest of all time stocks over the last few years where it's gone up you know 40x plus in just the last few years you know i'm starting to think okay there's there's a lot of potential here 
does this have the stake that goes with the sizzle? You know, he's recognizing, yeah, this IPO is down a bit. Is this potentially a bargain? Let's dive in a little bit more to understand. And so then here's where it gets even more interesting. And they talk about how since the beginning of 2018, we have invested over $1 billion across 15 strategic acquisitions and partnerships, you know, i.e. with app studios, games and technologies, where they're able to deploy their software and expertise to accelerate revenue growth. So they're taking their tools, their software that they know can help drive further app growth, further install growth, further monetization, and saying, hey, we see the apps that are out there. We're, they're either paying us or we see them elsewhere and we acquire them. And then after we acquire them, then we soup them up and they do really well. And they say the apps we acquired in 2018 and 2019 have increased their quarterly revenue over 100% on average, and they're looking to make more acquisitions in the future. So over a billion over, you know, in the last, you know, two years funding these types of acquisitions. So this is smelling interesting. This has definitely got my interest because not only is it a sort of an app, you know, a, a platform to enable other apps like Shopify, but it would be like the equivalent of Shopify buying other e-commerce companies, knowing what are the best practices to make it a best of breed. So it's it's kind of putting a, a foot in both or a finger in both pies here in terms of what the potential is. And then as we start looking a little more detail, we see their revenue has gone up by 3x in just the last two years. So now I'm really want to learn a lot more, you know, going from nearly 500 million in revenue to 1.5 billion, 1.5 billion in revenue. It's been relatively profitable the last, you know, three years. There was, it did dip into, uh, you know, a loss in 2020. So we'll want to understand that a little bit better. But looking at their EBITDA margins, which straps out a lot of these sort of, you know, one-off costs, you can see it's actually been very lucrative, 300 million plus, you know, EBITDA. So this is actually a cash cow as we're looking at this. This isn't, you know, a business that that needed to, you know, raise a bunch of capital because they have a huge cash burn. This is a cash cow. This strikes me as very interesting and I want to learn more. Um, but, you know, but before diving in and, and going more, you know, just a quick plug, you know, if this is if this is your first time watching, you know, my name is Daniel, you're watching Unrivaled Investing. Um, if you enjoy learning about potential multi-baggers, please make a point of subscribing. If you're enjoying this video and in enjoy learning about these types of high growth companies, please make a point of uh, hitting that thumbs up. And also, you know, if you want to follow my personal journey as I'm looking for potential multi-baggers, you know, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey, where each month I call it a monthly potential multi-bagger. I actually just posted my monthly potential multi-bagger for journey subscribers. It's a company that I think can go up 4X, so I'm quite excited about owning that. You know, I, I also have, you know, near the first week of the month, I do have a monthly portfolio update, and then just building a community of like-minded investors and also layering on more and more exclusive content like educational videos. You can see all my posts in the description of this video with the, 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 the digital content. So there's a link to that or catalog of content. And so what is the business model, you know, as, as we're looking at this, what, what is actually driving this? You know, we've seen some impressive top line growth. We sort of see, we're starting to understand the business model, but what, what's actually going on? And, you know, they, they split it up between business revenue and consumer revenue, which is about half and half, you know, half consumer revenue, half business revenue, uh, 700 million each, where you could see their consumer revenue really grew quite fast, over 86% growth in 2020. We need to dive deeper, though, to actually understand what are these moving pieces. And so you see consumer revenue, which is the bigger of the two uh, in 2020 and faster growing, um, is primarily in-app purchases, i.e. So this is their catalog of games and this is people buying stuff in the game, whether or not it's to make it a better experience or enrich you know, the, the player's experience or well, with their avatar or what have you, or maybe it's to remove ads or to, to speed up the game uh, so you don't have to sit around and wait as, as long. And you could see that the monthly active payers, so the people that are paying to play these games has gone up dramatically 5x in the last two years. And the amount that they're spending, the average revenue per monthly active payer has also gone up dramatically. So this is, this is a recipe for hyper growth where you get more and more payers, so more and more players that actively pay. And here it is, 1.5 million active payers in 2020 um, paying 40 bucks. And, for the, and that's the average revenue per monthly active payer. 
And so this is this is looking interesting. But then, you know, you start reading the, the additional detail, the additional disclosure, and they talks about how they talk about how apps acquired during 2020 generated 194 or 195 million of the increase year over year. So it's actually acquisitions that drove the bulk of this increase. So that's that is a little bit of a red flag where you're like, oh, okay, I thought this was going to be organic growth. This 86%, you know, growth year over year would be organic because you're going from like 400 million to 700 million plus. So, you know, like uh, 340 million about. And they're saying 194 million of which was from businesses they acquired during 2020. So that that I don't I don't like to see that as much because then, you know, it, it becomes a question of, well, how are you acquiring them? Is this is this from, you know, using your cash? You know, do you have enough cash flow or are you using debt? Or is this going to be issuing more stock in the future? So I, I much prefer organic growth stories versus this sort of dilutive, you know, question mark. So it is is the first red flag and let's keep going. And so then you start looking at their business revenue, this, this other segment. And, you know, I'm like, what? As I go through it, like the business gen revenue is from fees paid by mobile app advertisers or business clients, i.e. So these other apps that other games that are looking to monetize and that use their software to and then effectively pay for their software. OK, this makes sense. OK, that, that first part makes sense. So fees paid by mobile app advertisers or business clients that use our software to grow and monetize their app. This is what we talked about at the beginning. This was about you know, companies looking to grow their install base and increase their monetization, how much they can get for the ad, ad revenue that they have. But then the second part also starts becoming a little bit of a question mark, like what are you talking about or a problematic business model where they talk about how the business rev revenue from business clients that purchase the digital advertising inventory of our portfolio of apps. OK, so this this is the red flag. This is this is another red flag for me where they're saying these businesses that are looking to so these these businesses that are looking to grow their install base and improve their monetization what they direct them to so okay you, you have an app and you want to grow your install base what we want you to do is spend some ad revenue on these other apps so that way when you're playing these other apps you see an advertisement for another game and this other game is your game and we're going to effectively channel your desire to install to increase your install base by paying ad revenue on our portfolio of games that that seems like a very sort of complicated relationship potentially one where you're uh i don't know a little self-dealing you know it starts getting a little squishy of like well wait a second what segment are you looking to who 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 are you look which which segment do you want to optimize? Do you want to optimize the revenue for your own apps or are you looking to optimize the return on investment for these clients that are looking to grow their install base? So this is this is a real conflict of interest as I'm looking at this. Let's let's keep going. And so, you know, he, they keep going where they say we have nearly 1400 business clients as of 12/31/2020. Okay, so this is fitting into the thesis I was talking about earlier, which is that this is a huge market, literally millions of different apps, the vast majority of which, you know, are under monetized relative to a very small percentage that, you know, capture most of the share. So this there's an opportunity here for a lot of businesses to say, hey, how can we up our game? But then they go the vast majority of their clients or the vast majority of their revenue comes from these enterprise clients, i.e. bigger, bigger clients. So 99% of their revenue came from 172 clients. So this whole thesis of like helping businesses grow their install base, you know, capturing this huge market, and that's like the Shopify of helping apps. That thesis, I think, is is busted now because you you see this and you're like, no, this is really just helping 172 different enterprises because that's 99% of the revenue here. Now they do have you know some some good dollar based retention rate in 2020. You know, I'd be curious what the figure's been over time, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and so then they keep going. Business clients that purchase advertising inventory from our apps are able to target highly relevant users from our diverse and global portfolio of over 200 mobile games. So they have their catalog of content. You know, that they, they talked earlier, like the Netflix catalog of mobile games. And based on the users of their mobile games, they can put ads in there that would be relevant for these new customers that are looking to grow their apps. And they're saying, hey, if if someone's playing one of our games, 
that we either own outright or we're partnering with some sort of studio, they might also be interested in your game or we know the type of genre that you're interested in growing, we can help you out with this. It just doesn't strike me as a win-win when you start thinking about this because it's either you're taking your interest away from one app to the other and which one are you ultimately looking to grow over time. And so it's, you know, they talk about are able to match these ads with relevant users resulting in a better return on their advertising spend. So they're, they're saying, look, we know which genre you're interested in based on, you know, the, the players are already playing this app that we own. This, this game you have is a similar genre. You know, you, the advertising spend is going to be attractive. It's going to be a high, high ROI for them. Um, so I overall, this strikes me, you know, as I already mentioned, this is a big conflict of interest that I'm, that I'm thinking about here. But at least, you know, maybe they can make up for it with some hyper customer growth. You know, is, it, is this business, you know, the, the whole thesis with Shopify is you're tapping into this huge market. You're going to be experiencing this hyper growth. Um, so it, it's a really a question of, well, what have they done historically? You know, this 118% net dollar retention. So the, the customers that were at the end of 2019, they spent nearly 20% more year over year. So that includes whoever churned. So that's that starts getting me excited. But then, you know, I want to know, similar to Shopify thesis, am I seeing this incredible growth in number of merchants, number of apps that are using their platform? Let's keep going. Where, you know, here it is, the number of enterprise clients has actually gone down since 2018. And it's gone from 192 to 172. And that's a that's another big red flag. The wheels have come off the bus in terms of the thesis here. This is not good. You know, this is this is not what I want to see. I want to see, you know, steady up and to the right. And that's not what I'm seeing here. Now I am seeing more spend per client, which is good, but seeing a decline in enterprise clients, that's a big red flag. And then, you know, as I start looking a little bit more you know, a little greater detail. I see that they have this 75 million, you know, ad back for their EBITDA calculation, which is primarily, uh, primarily a non-cash charge tied to a loss on extinguishment of ex acquisition related contingent consideration. What's that mean? That really means that's an overly fancy way of saying a write-off based on an acquisition. So they made an acquisition and now they, they're, they, they, it, it costs them $75 million or costs them more than $75 million, but they're writing off 75 million of an acquisition that they did. And that, that also, you know, is, is con concerning for me, you know, as I'm thinking about this, because, you know, I'm reflecting on this and this whole strategy is, Hey, we put in a billion dollars over the last two years to accelerate our growth. And then I'm already seeing that 75 million is getting written off. I mean, that's seven and a half percent. Maybe it's less because it's over a billion dollars. But if your strategy is, you know, let's grow and we're going to reinvest this in the ecosystem, I need to see a good return on investment for that. And so far, I haven't really seen any metrics that make me go, oh, wow, this is an incredible return on invested capital versus this is going to be some write offs in the future. Uh, so I, I'm just not seeing the indications there. And then as we look, you know, at more detail, we see that their profitability margin or their EBITDA margin has actually dramatically dropped from around 53% to 24%. So, you know, the combination of all these different red flags, potential conflicts of interest with their business model, you know, I, it just strikes me as too hard for me at this point. I'd want the thesis to be a little bit clearer. So, you know, it's, it's not really surprising that, you know, the, so far the stock, you know, the, there's no love for the app love stock um you know then the question is you know let's let's look at this valuation framework uh you know and this is part of my value proposition to to all you know the 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 you know youtube subscribers so you can you can check this out uh you know there's a link to it in the description of this video and you know just looking at it like I, it's currently, it's it's down significantly from where it IPO'd. It's around $60 a share now. It's around $21 billion valuation. Uh, so what's the growth next year? They are making a sizable acquisition again um, that, that, you know, that happened in, or at least was signed in February. I don't know if it's actually been executed upon yet, but that's like another billion dollar acquisition that they're doing. That's like half cash and half, uh, half stock. And that drive, that's like a hundred, that's a hundred million in revenue about, 
Um, so that would be additional growth. But, you know, so it is a question of like, well, what's their growth going to look like in 2021? So I put a range of 20 to 40 percent, recognizing that 46 percent growth in 2020, you know, a large part of that was the acquisitions that they made of apps in 2020. And then, you know, what's the margin profile for this business longer term? They have something like a 60, mid 60s percent gross margin. So I'm putting 20 to 30 percent optimized margin for this business. And then, you know, you slap on some sort of tax rate of I'm slapping on 25 percent. That's sort of in flux. You know, we'll, we'll see with the current administration. And so that's an optimized profit you know, earnings multiple of something like 50 to 80 times or about a low teens price to forward sales, which, you know, doesn't strike me as hyper compelling. And then it's a follow up question of, well, wait a second, how much growth are you going to get in the future? Recognizing that this is really a story of, you know, additional M&A and how much, you know, capital are you going to, you know, how much are you going to lever up? Because uh, this is already starting to, you know, they're already, you know, putting debt on their balance sheet, um, you know, versus their organic growth of in-app purchases. And so, you know, I put a range of 15 to 35% annualized growth. And if you have a strong opinion about this, you know, look, that's part of the reason why I have this framework for you to play with. It's a hypothetical framework. You can play around with the growth rate, say, hey, I think this is going to be way better. You know, so you, you, you change that as you see fit. I just, you know, based on seeing their 2020 figures, I'm just less compelled, especially knowing that a lot of their growth in the last few years has been driven by acquisitions, partially debt funded that subsequently resulted in some write offs. So I'm like the, these are some of the, the concerns I've had. You know, I'm putting an N multiple of 15 to 25 times for it. Um, one could argue that I'm not being uh, conservative enough here because there will be debt financing costs um, that will impact their earnings that should result in even lower earnings. Um, but, you, but you do this and you know you do a range of 15 to 25 times from a low to high scenario. And all in all, I'm looking at effectively a, a coin flip in terms of what the risk reward looks like where it's like 80% upside and 70% downside. And so I just, I don't find this that compelling. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't find the thesis of the company super compelling. It, the story doesn't seem super straight. There's a, the pieces are a little too difficult to say, hey, this is definitively why you're going to win, especially based on the historic data where they lost enterprise clients from one year to the next. And so I, I'm not compelled by this story. Um, but look, the, this isn't, you know, the, I've go, I go over plenty of companies in this channel. One of my more recent videos was on Alibaba, which is a company that I actually, you know, I actually, in full disclosure, I do own. And as I pencil out, you know, I thought, hmm, this is interesting is, you know, Charlie Munger recently bought it and I thought the valuation was compelling. But if you want to know what I'm actively doing in my portfolio, what are the potential multibaggers, you know, that I'm looking at, go to unrivalinvesting.com where, you know, this is this is, you know, a screenshot from the catalog of content and under the multibaggers tag tab, um, you can see the April 2021 potential multibagger. So this is part of the exclusive content where, you know, I think it has 4x potential. And that's, you know, a much better risk reward than what I think you can see with, with you know, app loving, or maybe I should say no loving here. And so if, if you enjoyed this video learning about app loving, please make a point of subscribing and hitting that thumbs up button. Thanks so much for watching.